Now, I don't know uh, if I need to put my preaching face on because I'm a little nervous, and I wonder if I come up here and sin because I'm nervous. You know, when it is God, I should be concerned about uh, being approved of what I have to say and not you all or even myself as if I want to impress you or impress myself. In that regard, I just have to remember what the scripture says when the Lord says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Because right now, I need to remember that word. I want to welcome and thank you all for this opportunity to stand before you and to speak forth the truths of God from his word. It is a great privilege of mine to stand before you, men of God, some of you who are pastors, some of you who are college and seminary professors, some who are elders and deacons in your churches, and others who are lay leaders, and also stand before you, women of God, as well. I consider it a great privilege and honor that the Lord God has given to me. And I, can, I think it is an amazing thing and most miraculous that God can take the very weak in this world, the unimportant and the no name, and use those people to communicate his truths to those who are being saved and to those who are perishing. I praise God that he has also prepared great men of God, men who have been molded, who have been prepared in the crucible of life, seminary studies, the pastorate, ministry, failures, hardships, heartbreaks, disappointments, persecutions, and even betrayal. Men of God whom God has prepared for his great work of communicating Christ in word and deed, again, to those who are being saved and to those who are perishing. Men who you will hear speak at this conference and who you've already heard speak at this conference. But to begin this conference, you will hear from me, <laughs> one who fits in the first category, uh, not the latter. And in this regard, uh, prayer is necessary. So will you pray with me? Father God in heaven, most glorious and high God, whose name is above all names and is most worthy of praise, honor, worship, adoration, and exaltation, the creator of all things, the one who established the foundations of the earth, the one who holds the universe in the palm of his hand, the one who is awesome in power and wisdom, whose ways are unfathomable, whose thoughts are unsearchable. It is to you we stand before, recognizing our great need for your mercy and wisdom, for understanding and illumination, for righteousness and holiness. We bow our heads, our hearts, and our minds before your sovereign authority as it's revealed to us in and through your word. For it is through your word that we become aware of who you are and who we are in relation to you. For it is through your word that we find hope, peace, knowledge, joy, salvation, redemption, life. Holy Spirit, prepare us to receive your word today. Illumine our hearts and our minds and grant us understanding and ability that we will live by your word, affirming in our hearts and actions the word spoken by our Lord Jesus as he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is in the wonderful and strong name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit that we pray and all of God's people say, Amen. You know, I must tell you about an experience that I just recently had after weeks, perhaps months of constant reminding by my wife, I went to get a physical exam. Now, it had been at least six years since I had had a physical. And now that I'm over 40 years old, 
the type of physical that I was going to get was drastically different than what I've ever had before. It seemed to be less of me getting a physical exam, but the doctor getting physical with me. <laughs> That's what it seemed. The doctor jabbing and putting his hands where no hands had gone before, <laughs> telling me to turn my head to the left and cough, you know, perhaps so that I wouldn't be a witness to what he was doing, <laughs> but most likely so I wouldn't just cough in his face. All in the name of a physical exam. But during a follow-up exam, now you might have thought that I had enough of this the first time, but I had to go back. But during a follow-up exam, while I was waiting on the doctor, I was looking around the exam room and found a poster on the wall. The poster, a poster of the human muscular system. Now I had seen these posters before, but this time the poster caught my attention. And I began to really examine the muscular system of the human body. I was amazed when I began to see and think about how complicated the muscular system was. Muscle, over 670 muscles interacting with one another so that the body can stand and have mobility. Muscle over the top of muscle over the top of muscle, crisscrossing each other with various lengths and sizes. Muscles connected to bones with tendons making it look like the muscles were growing out of the bones like branches. Muscles having to work together as a team in order for movement to occur because muscles only contract or pull. They don't push. So in order to bend your arm, you have to have one set of muscles, your biceps contracting while the triceps are releasing. And to straighten your arm, the triceps are contracting while the biceps are releasing. We have voluntary, uh, voluntary muscles, like those in the arms, legs, hands, that we control by our thoughts. And then we have involuntary muscles, like our diaphragm and our heart, that we don't even think about, and they just operate automatically. As I was looking at that poster and thinking about how intricately woven together is the muscular system of the human body, and how complicated a process it is for all these muscles to work to, to contract and release in order for movement, for the simplest movement to occur, I was just amazed and said out loud, God, you are amazing. You are amazing. The wisdom that it took to design the human body this way. Now, this is a type of emotional response that the creation can elicit in us when we just sit and reflect upon it. We're able to know something about God in and through creation. What I just told you about was my own personal experience of being amazed at God through reflection on his creation. But it is the psalmist who can give us a better understanding through his reflection on creation and on the word of God what it is that we can know about God in and through creation and in and through the word of God, particularly the sufficiency of scripture in knowing God. So let us now turn our attention to Psalm 19 and consider the words of this psalm as I read from the English Standard Version of the Bible. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor other words whose voice is not heard. The measuring line goes out through all the earth and the words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, 
making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The Psalms, like no other genre or type of literature found in Scripture, or an avenue for the expression of emotions. The psalmist expresses his emotions to God, about God, the psalmist himself, his circumstances, or his enemies. The psalms are generally classified as thanksgiving psalms, lament psalms, kingship or messianic psalms, hymns or praise psalms, remembrance psalms, and psalms of confidence. It will be easy to see as we look at Psalm 19 that it can be classified as a hymn or praise psalm. This is not because Psalm 19 begins with what is usually considered to be an identifier of a hymn, which is the call to worship as seen, for example, in Psalm 103, and be, which begins with the word, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Psalm 19 doesn't start with a call to worship, but gives the reason for which to praise God. The psalm is divided up into three sections, with the first two sections consisting of reflections, specifically reflections on the creation in verses 1 through 6, and reflections on the word of God in verses 7 through 11. And the final section, verses 12 through 14, consisting of a prayer, which is the psalmist's proper response to his reflections. The last verse, verse 14a in the psalm is the key to understanding how it is that this psalm came to be. Let's listen to it. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. For here the psalmist tells us that the psalm is the words of his mouth. And these words stem from, originated in, or were sourced out of the meditation of his heart. This meditation is one act of meditation, one time of meditation, one process of meditating. Now, some, call, some scholars consider that the first section of the psalm, the reflection on creation, was written independently of the second section, the reflection on the word of God, because of the different use of the, of the names of God. There also seems to be an abrupt transition from the first to the second section. Others see the first and the second section as one composition. As I was reflecting on the psalm, it seems to be a natural transition to move from the creation to the word of God as we come to understand the point that the psalmist is trying to communicate in his reflections. Let's look at the first section in some detail. Verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. This is Hebrew poetry at its finest. Two lines parallel with one another in thought and related in meaning. With the second line carrying forth the meaning of the first line. The psalmist reveals to us what it is that the heavens do. They declare the glory of God. Now, this is not just a one-time declaration as if only right now or at this present moment uh, this is occurring. It is a continual, uninterrupted declaration noted by the use of the present participle form of the Hebrew verb. It is an action that has always occurred, is now occurring, and will always occur until the heavens are no more. What is the glory of God? that the heavens declare. It is the second line that brings this forth as it states 
as it states that the sky above proclaims his handiwork. It is the handiwork of God that is seen in the sky. Job 9, 8, referring to what God did in the sky, says, Who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea? Who made the bear and Orion, the Pleiades, and the chambers of the south? The constellations, these clusters of stars, recognized in the time of Job as being the handiwork of God. Listen to Amos 5, 8. He who made the Pleiades and Orion and turns the deep darkness into the morning and darkens the day into night. The Lord is his name. It is in the stars, it is the stars in the sky, the sun and the moon which show forth God's wisdom, power, skill, and faithfulness in his creation. God's wisdom is shown in placing them in the heavens exactly where he wanted them to be placed for the purposes of which are known to him. God's power is shown in creating them and being able to hold them in their place so that they would not be moved. God's skill is shown in the variation of the stars with regards to their brightness and size and the formation of the constellations, his artwork in the sky. The psalmist, as he continues to reflect on their creation, says in verse 2, day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor other words whose voice is not heard. Their measuring line goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. From one day to the next, each day, continuing from the previous day, speech or instruction or lessons about God, given, for example, in the light returning to the earth and the movement of the sun across the sky. From one night to the next, each night, continuing from the previous night, revealing the knowledge about God in the course of the stars, their number, the position of the constellation in varying seasons. God's faithfulness is shown in the reliability of the day and the night, the season and the years. Yet the psalmist says that there is no speech, no other words whose voice is not heard. The heavens in making their declaration do not use audible speech or words. There is no sound emanating from them. The heavens are silent. Yet verse 4 lets us know that the declaration of the heavens are understood by all peoples, languages, tribes, tongues, and nations. For the declaration of the heavens is universal as the word goes out into all the world. The psalmist focuses his meditation on one object of the creation in verse 5 and paints the picture of the sun in all its brilliance running its course in the sky with delight as a groom who has come forth from his wedding suite after his first night with his new wife and with confidence and determination as a strong man. The brilliance of the sun and its radiating heat leaves no one anywhere in the world untouched. Again, reinforcing the idea that the creation's revelation about God, his power, wisdom, skill, and faithfulness is made known to all. Listen to a New Testament passage in Romans 1, 19, and 20 as it speaks regarding the revelation of God in creation. It says, for what can be known about God is plain to them, meaning humanity, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. It is the sinfulness of human beings which causes man to naturally suppress the revelation of God in the creation and interpret it wrongly. Romans 1, 21 through 23 says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. So humans, in the futility of their thinking, honor the creation in worship with imagined things from Mother Nature or naturalism, 
which one man defines as the personification of the natural wisdom found in the world around us and states that Mother Nature is evolution in drag, a decoy or mirage designed to cause people to look past the true creator and to focus on a surrogate. Unto things like Buddha, or to the company of the Hindu gods and goddesses, or to animism, which is the belief that everything has a soul, such as rocks and trees, mountains, rivers, animals, stars, and so on. And as such, these things have life and can help or hurt humans. So people idolize and worship these things that God created. Creation is sufficient as the revelation of God to condemn mankind since mankind has clearly perceived in the creation God's eternal power and divine nature. Yet mankind has exchanged the glory of God seen in creation for images resembling the creation and thus the wrath of God is upon him. The psalmist as he concludes his meditation on the creation and what it reveals about God, is unable to stop at meditating on creation. He's unable to stop there, for he knows that it is through the word of God that he himself knows God. Although he knows that this revelation of God in creation is made known to all peoples everywhere, this general revelation is insufficient to bring people to know God. God. So the psalmist stirred up in his heart because of his meditation on the creation and seeing God all in it naturally, naturally moves to the word of God. For he knows that it is in the word of God that one actually comes to know God and not just know about him. It is this joy in having the word of God that leads him further in his praise. So as the psalmist continues in his reflection, he continues on the word of God, telling us how we know God in and through his word. Listen to verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The psalmist shifts from using the general Hebrew word for God, El, as he did in verse 1, when reflecting on creation and its revelation of God to the covenant name for God, Yahweh or Adonai, given to Moses on Mount Sinai, indicating the psalmist's personal interaction and relationship with God through his word given in the form of the Mosaic covenant. The psalmist says that the law of the Lord is perfect. What is the law? It is not just the first five books of the Old Testament or just the Ten Commandments that he's referring to. It represents the totality of God's teachings and instructions as found in his word. It specifically speaks of God's revealed truth in contradistinction to that which is revealed in creation. This is that which is perfect, meaning that it is lacking nothing with regards to the completeness, to its completeness, or that which it should be. It is complete as the revelation of divine truth, of God himself, not just the work of God as seen in creation, but the person of God, the purposes of God, the presence of God, the primacy of God. It is complete as a rule of conduct for humanity. How do we know that the law of the Lord is sufficient for knowing God, it is because the psalmist tells us of the effect that it has. It revives the soul. It brings to life that which is dead. It turns men from sinfulness, suppressing the knowledge of God, idolatry, immorality, and all manners of wickedness and unrighteousness to holiness. It breathes life into that which is dead so that human beings, as living creatures, can re may relate to tr in truth to the God who created them. We don't want to make any mistake. It is not the law of God that does this on its own power. But when the law of God is applied to the heart of man, 
when it is made to bear on the soul of human beings, then is seen the effect of the law of God, which is life. The power to revive the soul and for men to know God goes forth from the word of God and not from the revelation of God given in creation or from the philosophical or religious imaginations of man. The psalmist continues with the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. That to which the Lord testifies to or declares as being good, right, and true is in his word. How do we know that the testimony of the Lord is sufficient for knowing God? It is because the psalmist tells us of the effect that it has. It makes the wise simple. I mean, it makes the simple wise. Wisdom is found in the Lord, for he alone is wise. Whether it's matters of morality, ethics, societal living, personal economics, religion, marriage, family, government, and so on, God's word speaks to it, and God's wisdom is found in it. And those who are made wise are made wise through knowing God in his word. We again see Hebrew poetry at its finest. While the psalmist is communicating uh, related meaning in the two phrases, he begins a progression of the one who knows God through the word of God. First, the revival of the soul, life through the word of God. Then, obtaining wisdom, which is knowledge of God and instruction about God and for holy living through the word of God. The psalmist continues this progression in verse 8. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The precepts of the Lord are a specification of the law of the Lord. They refer to the rules that originate strictly as a result of the Lord being the divine authority. They're right not just because they have been appointed by the divine authority as laws are right because they have been appointed by the human authority, as human laws are right because they've been appointed by human authority, but they are right because they are inherently right and just and equitable. How do we know that the precepts of the Lord are sufficient for knowing God? It is because the psalmist tells us of the effect that they have. They make the heart rejoice. True joy and thus rejoicing comes from knowing God. This joy originates in seeing and understanding the rightness and justice and equitableness of the precepts of the Lord. And knowing that because these precepts originate in the Lord, that he himself is right and just and equitable. The Lord always does what is right. The Lord is just, never being unfair in his treatment of human beings. The Lord is equitable, always giving each person what is due, showing no partiality. The rejoicing of the heart comes in knowing God through his precepts and following his precepts in obedience. The psalmist continues with the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The commandments are another specification of the law of the Lord, and they refer to those things that are required by God of people. To speak of the commandments as being pure means that there is no blemish, no corruptness, no imperfections in them at all. How do we know that the commandments of the Lord are sufficient for knowing God? It is because the psalmist tells us of the effect that they have. They cause the eyes to be enlightened. The commandments of God causes one to see in his heart and soul what is right and proper and to understand what it is that one should do and the way that one should go. They cause us to see God's truth and reveal the holiness of God. The eyes are enlightened in knowing God through his commandments. The progression of the person who knows God through his word continues from verse 7 to verse 8. In verse 7, the progression began with the revival of the soul, that is life through the word of God. 
then the obtaining of wisdom, that is, knowledge of God and instruction about God and for holy living through the word of God. And in verse 8, the rejoicing of the heart, that is, joy through the word of God. And then finally, the enlightening of the eyes, and that is understanding as to what is right and proper through the word of God. The psalmist continues on in his praise in verse 9, focusing not so much on the effect of the word of God on human beings, but on the inherent qualities of the word of God. In verse 9, he says, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Now, the fear of the Lord in this passage is used in a figurative sense. The figurative use is called a metonymy, where the name of one thing is substituted for, the na- for, for something that is associated with it. In this case, it is called a metonymy of effect, where the effect is substituted for the cause of the effect. The fear of the Lord in this verse is substituted for the thing that causes or brings about the fear of the Lord. And the thing that brings about or causes the fear of the Lord is the word of God. Now, what is the fear of the Lord? It is the worship or reverence of the Lord. We can know that the word of God is sufficient for knowing God because the word of God promotes the worship or fear of the Lord. It is clean, meaning that nothing in it corrupts or defiles and that its tendency is to make one holy and to cleanse the soul. The psalmist tells us of a quality of the fear of the Lord and that is, uh, that is of the word of God and this is that it endures forever. It is not temporary, nor is its work destined to pass away. What it does now in making one holy, it will continue to do forever. The psalmist continues in the second line, stating the rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. These, again, are inherent qualities. Inherent qualities of the rules of God in that they are in accordance with what is true and rightly representative of reality. They are altogether righteous in that not one of them is improper or unjust. The psalmist, as he comes to the end of his meditation on the word of God, sums up his praise for the word of God in verses 10 and 11. And he says, More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter than honey and drippings from the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, In keeping them there is great reward. The psalmist recognizes that there is nothing more precious or valuable than the word of God because the word of God leads to the knowing of God, which results in life, wisdom, joy, and understanding. And the word of God leads to great rewards for those who walk in obedience to it. The psalmist in no way disparages the revelation of God through the works of creation, but he testifies by the value that he places on the word of God to the sufficiency and the superiority of the revelation of God through his word. The psalmist now responds in the only way appropriate after reflecting on the word of God, and that is in prayer. Listen to verses 12 and 13. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. The psalmist, after affirming the value of the word of God and delighting in keeping them, however, sees through the word of God his own imperfections, immorality, and sinfulness and that these are deeper and more numerous than what he can even know or discern. He prays for forgiveness from hidden faults. Those things that he is not even aware of is within him, and for God to purify him of them. 
He requests that God restrain him from committing sins that stem from pride and arrogance and that these things will not have dominion or control over him. Then and only then will he be innocent of such sin through God's intervention and thus be able to walk in obedience to, to the word of God. The psalmist concludes this psalm with first a petition that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Then with an acknowledgement, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The psalmist is able to acknowledge God as his redeemer because it is through the word of God that the psalmist knows God as redeemer and not just creator. In all that which has been given to mankind, in all that which human beings have access to, it is the word of God alone that is sufficient for knowing God. Let us pray. <sighs> oh, Father, we rejoice and praise you for the revelation that you have given to us in your creation. For it is indeed fascinating to see your wisdom power, skill, and faithfulness displayed through your created things. But we rejoice even more so in your word, for it is the means by which we know you personally and intimately. May we eat of it always and abundantly, that we, that we may walk close to you for the glory of your name. It is in the saving name of Jesus Christ and by the power of of the Holy Spirit that we pray. And all of God's people say, amen.